Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Thanks for joining our Stantec webinar series today on the new uh, revision to the steam electric generation effluent limit guidelines. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get going. Um, you will be muted for the presentation. You're welcome to ask questions at any time using the questions option in GoToWebinar. We will read those at the end, and um, based on how many we get, we'll get through as many as we can, obviously. Um, I'll also give you uh, an ability to unmute yourself with about five, ten minutes left if you'd like to either comment or follow up or ask a question live, uh, I'll give you that option as well. Uh, there will be a recording of this. You'll receive an email from GoToWebinar with the recording. We'll also post it to our website. I'll give you that link in a bit. And everyone in attendance, I will send you a certificate of attendance that you can submit uh, for professional development hours. It's up to the individual agency if they accept it, but we will give you that certificate of attendance to hopefully get you some, some PDH credit. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Kennedy, who's a senior principal for Stantec and an uh, expert in everything ELG and uh, industrial wastewater treatment. So, kick it off, Bill. All right. Well, uh, good good morning, good afternoon, good evening again. Uh, I was looking at our registration list, and it looks like we have folks from across the globe that are actually participating, seeing what uh, the US EPA effluent limitation guidelines, how they're going to affect not only the coal industry, but how they may be used as a, as a standard in other nations around the world. Uh, so with that, let me, let me switch into the webinar, turn off my camera, and we'll get started here. So once again, um, welcome. I'm Bill Kennedy. I'm with uh, with Stantec in our Charlotte, North Carolina office. I'm a senior principal working in our industrial uh, water group. Uh, spent, a, spent a little bit of time working with the effluent limitation guidelines and I was thinking back uh, just the other day that, the, uh, that it's a trade-off on the number of coal fire power plants that uh, were identified as BAT, best available technology that have either retired or are uh, have announced their retirement here lately, and the individuals involved in the process, not only from industry, industry groups, and on the regulatory front, who have also retired since this process started uh, back some 15 or so years ago. Uh, so when when we talk about the final rule finally came out, eh, it's not not quite the final. There's still some things that are coming, but. Uh, it's it's been a while, and we're we're glad to see that we've we've made progress here. I'd like to kick off with a quick safety moment. Uh, this is Fire Prevention Week here in the United States, and uh, just as part of our safety moment, our theme is serve up safety, fire safety in the kitchen. Um, unattended cooking is actually the leading cause of fires in the kitchen. So if you are cooking, if you're doing something like fry, frying, boiling, grilling, or whatnot, use a timer or maybe carry around a wooden spoon to remind you that there's actually something on the stove. Uh, put a lid on it. Uh, simple steps to keep kitchen fire from getting out of control. Keep a lid nearby the stove in case of grease fire starts. Never, never use a fire extinguisher on a grease fire. It tends to blow the flames across the stove, blow the grease across the stove. Uh, in case of an oven or microwave fire, close the door, let it burn out um, lack of oxygen. Keep, keep your cooking areas clear, keep clutter uh, away from, from your stovetop, give the appliances space to uh, you know, keep heat from building up. Uh, uh, anything that can catch fire, once again, keep it away. Uh, especially with a lot of our flat glass top counter tops, they're not a place to put your grocery bags, put your pizza boxes, uh, or drop your mail. Uh, and then prevent scalds and burns. Hot liquids or steam from the stove or oven can cause serious injuries. Turn the pot handles away from the stove edge. Don't have them in a place where somebody can bump into them. Keep your face away from the oven door uh, before opening it. I'm sure we've all done that. Uh, just as the rush of heat and steam that comes out of there, stay out of the line of fire. 
and make sure your cords are coiled up in good working condition and also away from the counter edges. So with that, let's let's get into the rule. Um, uh, the revised rule, uh, the effluent limitation guidelines and standards for steam electric power generating point source category is the official name. And for those of you that really get into trivia, I've got some more information on the on the screen here. It's 40 CFR part 423. Uh, the latest reconsideration of the rule uh, specifically addresses flue gas desulfurization wastewater and also bottom mash transport water. And I, I know several of you are interested in following what's going on in the docket. Um, yeah, the docket number is is there for your ready reference. Uh, and then we have our legal disclaimer on the slide here. The following is a technical overview of the proposed rule and it's not intended to be a comprehensive or not to be comprehensive or provide legal interpretation advice or site-specific regulatory guidance. So that keeps my attorneys happy. And um, at the same time, if you have any questions as we go along, as Ryan mentioned, please feel free to type them in um, and we can see if we have time at the end to address them or feel free to reach out directly to, to myself or other members of my team. So as we go through here, like any good regulation, there are a number of acronyms in there, like call them TLAs, three letter acronyms. Um, and we got a quick glossary for you there, BAT, BMP, BPJ, BPT. There's a new one that came around, Capacity Utilization Rating, CUR, which some of you may not be familiar with. Uh, POTW and PSES. So those are those are some of the main ones out there, and they'll be addressed on the slides once again. But just wanted to give you a quick heads up as we go through. Uh, as as we're as I'm working through the slides here, uh, I've I, I will be reading some of these things directly as they are the wording that comes out of the rule. So being very careful not to uh, not to uh, allow for any misinterpretation of what may be out there. So, so let's let's start off with our FGD limits. So, definition of FGD, uh, FGD wastewater, is that which is generated specifically from wet FGD scrubber systems that comes into contact with flue gas or FGD solids, including blow down from, from the scrubber system, over or underflow from the solid separation process and think hydrocyclones there. FGD solids wash water, you can read that as chlorides wash. Uh, filtrate from the solids dewatering system and that would be from your gypsum belt filtrate there. Uh, those would be typical examples. The following are not considered wastewater, FGD wastewater. Any of the cleaning waters from the scrubber, solid separation and dewatering equipment, cleaning water from paste transportation piping. And I put that in there specifically because EPA uh, mentions paste several times through both the preamble technical development document um, and that, that goes very much into the VIP uh, voluntary um, uh, the voluntary program that's in there. Uh, any floor drains in the FGD process area, treated FGD uh, wastewater, uh, which would be a permeate or distillate from whether it's a membrane system or a thermal treatment system that's used in boiler makeup water. So any clean water that's that's generated that can be reused in the boiler. So the limits themselves, uh, put up here what, what was in the 2015 iteration of the rule and now what's in the 2020 iteration of the rule. These are the uh, BAT best available technology economically achievable. And that economically achievable is the value statement that goes along with BAT and along with any pretreatment standards if you were going to, uh, to a, uh, such as a POTW, a municipal wastewater treatment uh, plant. 
so as as we go through here, and I'm I'm sure those of you that have scanned the rule have have uh, went straight to the to the back pages and looked at the tables. Uh, the 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 key the key numbers I always think are your 30-day average values given the analytical turnaround here. Arsenic on the 30-day uh, rolling average really didn't well it didn't change. Uh, it remained at eight parts per billion. Uh, but as you can see, the, uh, the the daily max went from 11 to 18 to allow for more variability. On mercury, uh, we we dropped the decimal place there. We went from 356 parts per trillion down to 34 parts per trillion. And I can assure you that there are several of us on the call here that have more mercury in our saliva due to some of our old fillings from when we had our jawbreakers and now and laters as a kid than what's allowed in our wastewater today. Uh, with a daily max for mercury of 103 parts per trillion, selenium uh, uh, ended up going from 12 to 29 with a daily max of 70 parts per billion. Uh, nitrates as nitrate nitrites uh, as nitrogen uh, dropped from 4.3 down to three with a daily max of four parts per million. And, and here's where we get gets into the meat. Uh, the implementation date is one year after publication in the Federal Register. Uh, I checked last night uh, before I logged off here at the office and I saw the government printing office has still not uh, published the rule and we anticipate it coming out any day, but any day can be any day. Hopefully it'll be out before before the end of October. Um, the no later than date on when these limits need to be incorporated into a permit uh, and complied with would be moved out two years to December 31st of 2025. So with any good rule, we have exceptions. So the first exception is the low capacity utilization. Uh, this is defined as a two year, that would be a two calendar year. And I put calendar in, in parentheses for a reason. Uh, two year average annual generation of less than 10% of the nameplate capacity of the individual unit. Uh, so if you have a site with multiple units, you need to hit that criteria uh, for each individual unit for the entire site to qualify. Now, in the pre-publication version, it was unclear if this was a two calendar year or a rolling 24 month average as there were references in both the preamble and the final rule to two years and 24 months. We anticipate that there will, this, this conflict there will be rectified in the final publication of the rule here. Uh, if you have a high flow facility, and to the best of most people's knowledge, there is only one facility in the country that meets this criteria of discharging more than 4 million gallons per day of FGD wastewater, which is approximately 2,777 gallons per minute, you have your own category and exception to the, to the BAT rule. If you plan to cease coal combustion by December 31st of 28, there's another exception there. And the voluntary incentive plan, uh, which was offered up under the 2015 version of the rule was modified uh, from, from a focus on thermal treatment, to shifting to more of a membrane-based technology. And we'll talk about all these a little bit more in, in, in the coming slides. So exception number one, low capacity utilization boilers. We go back to the, to the 2015 limits of, for arsenic and mercury. Uh, you'll notice that selenium and nitrate limits don't apply to this low capacity utilization exemption. Uh, but there's, you get, get into the details now. First of all, the soon as date on this is one month, excuse me, one year after the 
publication in the Federal Register. And compliance to these limits uh, needs to occur by December 31st of 23. So there's a uh, there's pretty tight schedule there. It requires initial certification and annual recertification using EIA submission data. It's data that the uh, the individual uh, unit or data that the utilities are collecting for the individual units on a regular ongoing basis are ready. Failure to annually recertify requires compliance to BAT limits within two years of that recertification due date. So when, when you apply for these low capacity utilization exemption here, you're actually making a commitment. And if you take a look at some typical project schedules that are out there for uh, past FGD wastewater treatment installations using physical chemical treatment, biological treatment, uh, those, those project cycles are certainly in excess of two years. So make, make sure you're, you're looking into the future uh, and and, and make sure this is communicated with all the various parties at your utility that need to be aware of the consequences of running a boiler on a unit a little bit longer than they really should. High flow exemption, once again, we go back to the 2015 limits of for mercury and arsenic, dropping selenium and nitrate uh, nitrite limits off of here. Uh, the definition for high flow is the maximum daily volume that can be discharged by a facility uh, over 4 million gallons per day after accounting for maximum recycle based on the materials of construction. So if your scrubber is designed to handle chloride levels of eight or 10,000 parts per million, and you're only running at 3,500 parts per million, you need to take a look at scrubber operations to make sure that you're pushing the maximum recycle rate that you can achieve um, to maintain that qualification. My crystal ball indicates, and so does my Google News Feed, that the environmental groups have taken notice of the high flow exemption and are getting their arrows sharpened and their quivers loaded. So be prepared as, as any good Boy Scout here. The as soon as possible date for compliance with these limits is one year after publication. And so we're looking at potentially October of next year. Uh, that's the as soon as possible date. And then once again, uh, no later than December 31st of 23. The coal-fired retirement exemption applies to any units that cease coal fire operation by December of 28. It also uh, does not, uh, it also applies to any, uh, any units that have a nameplate capacity of less than 50 megawatts. Not sure if there are too many of those left in the country or that uh, units that are oil fired. We go back to the what are classically referred to as the BPJ limits. Um, that really TSS is the only only criteria that's on the table, uh, and, and that's the 30 parts per million on a 30-day uh, average. Now, you need to make the decision. Notice the plan participation must be submitted within one year of the publication date. So between now and October timeframe next year, uh, not only does the decision need to be made to uh, cease coal firing of that unit, but the application needs to be prepared and submitted. And this includes the estimated date of shutdown or fuel conversion, the approval status, and the most recent integrated resource plan that was submitted to your uh, regulatory agencies. Uh, to ensure that they have approved that, that plan. And then annual progress reports are required uh, demonstrating progress to this, uh, uh, this retirement. TSS limits are, are equal to the current uh, BPT. That's why we're not seeing any sort of implementation period. Uh, it's a here and now. The the last exception is the voluntary incentive plan. And this is based on, as I mentioned earlier, membrane technology, 
and also that encapsulation technologies. So being able to clean up the water uh, using membranes, that's uh, been fairly well demonstrated. Uh, the problem is, well, what do you do with the brine? This is the proverbial dog chasing the bus, and what does the dog do with it once, once he catches the bus? Uh, and there's, as I mentioned, pace technology, encapsulation technology has been mentioned a number of times through the, through the documents associated with this rule. Um, yeah, not not something that has been widely explored um, or certainly not widely implemented within the U.S. electric power industry. Uh, you'll notice on the limits on the VIP program is that the arsenic has a daily max of five. Uh, the thoughts were that we're so close to reporting limits for the matrix that it doesn't really make sense to have a 30-day average also. Uh, mercury drops down to 23 and 10 parts per trillion. Selenium, similar to arsenic, only has a daily max of 10 parts per billion. Nitrate nitrites, 2.0 and 1.2 respectively. And then bromide gets added. Um, I think this was a, a nod to, uh, to some of the drinking water uh, uh, agencies and facilities ac across the country that have been lobbying for bromide limits. Uh, so bromide uh, is certainly on here at 0.2 parts per million, along with TDS of 306 and 149. Uh, just, I, I know there have been some folks that have been discussing the in, using the VIP program. Uh, just beware that additional constituents will be added to your permit, even though you have a delay of not having to spend the capital and be in service until December of 28. Uh, you know, it does come with some, some strings attached, so make sure that decisions are being made eyes wide open. Um, moving on to bottom ash transport water, uh, this, this gets, uh, this this was one where communications between industry and regulatory agencies, I, I think, demonstrated a success. Uh, what is bottom ash transport water? Well, first of all, it's the water used to convey, and I underline that. That was my emphasis, not the agencies, to convey bottom ash or economize or ash from the ash collection or storage equipment uh, or boiler and has a direct contact with ash. Uh, the following are not considered transport water, and that would be any sort of low volume, short duration discharges from minor leaks, uh, minor maintenance events, cleaning water from FGD paste equipment, and the word paste comes up again, um, bottom ash uh, purge water. And as, as you go through here, just as we go through here, just keep in mind low volume. Uh, is is clearly mentioned here and minor maintenance and the agency certainly had some some very specifics in mind as we look at what's required for certification. So what what are the limits? In 2015 it was zero discharge, although you could send to the scrubber subject to FGD limits at that point. And then in 2020 now it's sort of zero discharge. We can still send to the scrubber, but under some very defined user condition, under some very defined conditions, may discharge on a 30-day rolling average up to 10% of the primary active wetted system volume. And I'll speak to that again uh, in later slides, but the key words there are primary active wetted system volume. Uh, as far as the limits, uh, since there was zero discharge in 2015, there were no limits. In, the, in 2020 now, the preamble, preamble discusses site-specific BAT limits on discharges determined by best professional judgment. Uh, this, is, this is an area where you want to have very clear communications with your permitting authorities, your permitting permit writers, uh, 
EPA has spent the last 15 or more years working on this rule, and now they're tossing uh, best professional judgment evaluation over to your, the state agencies to do something in a time period with less resources, with, do something with less resources in a time period that is typically required for, a, for an NPDES renewal uh, process. Uh, so that's, that's one where uh, communications ahead of time, if you're gonna look to having a purge stream off your bottom ash, once again, be prepared. Stantec can certainly help you with some of that evaluation process um, and can help you make submittals to, to your state agencies and aiding them to pull together a BPJ. So as soon as possible beginning, once again, we're looking at one year from the publication date, but no later than December of 20, uh, 2025. So bottom mash transport water, and we've got lots of fine print here, requires a properly installed, operated, and maintained bottom mash system. Uh, this, gets, this gets very, uh, this, this is a point that utilities need to watch and be, and be very aware of at all levels of the organization as we as trying to reduce O and M costs and constantly but uh, cutting budgets at the plant level. Uh, the rule allows discharge uh, to maintain system water balance due to defined storm events when unmanageable by installed spares, redundancies, maintenance tanks, and other system equipment. Uh, it also allows to maintain a discharge if you need to maintain your system water balance when regular inflows from other waste streams exceed the ability of the system to accept recycled water and segregation is not feasible. Uh, to conduct maintenance when water volumes cannot be managed by the other equipment and to maintain system chemistry if unable to manage pH, corrosion, corrosive substances, scaling, or fine particulate to below levels that impact system operations. Those all sound very reasonable uh, at face value. Uh, that discharge uh, uh, allowance shall not exceed a 30-day rolling average of 10% of the primary, here we go again, primary active wetted bottom ash system volume and determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the permitting authority. So once again, your local permit writer has the ability to use their judgment to determine if what you think should be included in the volume of the system is, is, is actually acceptable or not. Uh, the system volume shall be the maximum wetted volume, and that wetted again, of bottom ash transport water in all collection and recirculation piping and tanks, including clarifiers, troughs, hoppers, as certified by a professional engineer, excluding your installed spares, your redundancies, your maintenance tanks, any surface impoundments, and non bottom ash transport systems that may direct process water into the system. So these are your exceptions. So your system that you thought was pretty good size suddenly became much smaller as your maintenance tanks and your installed spares, your redundant uh, clarifiers and your second backup tanks, basically all your redundancies get taken out of this definition. The certification process requires is not only an initial certification, but also an annual certification. It's needs to be prepared by a professional engineer. Um, and EPA went on a little bit further that it was a licensed professional engineer in your jurisdiction, um, which is almost a little redundant there because if they're not licensed, then they're not a professional engineer in your jurisdiction, but be that as it may. Um, the PE must certify, the PE, E must certify that they are familiar with the regulation itself and the facility. Uh, they must calculate, or it, it must state what the primary wetted volume of the system is, 
list of potential discharges, volume and frequency of those discharges, list of wastewater treatment systems that are on site. And as I read this, this is what are all your wastewater treatments that are on site, a narrative about these wastewater systems, uh, any material assumptions and information supporting the calculations for primary wetted volume, and the submittal is due by the as soon as possible date, which is 12 months uh, from publication date, which if we go back here, we will see that it's um, uh, essentially next October. So this is one that if you look to have a purge stream that you want to get moving on that uh, certification process and start engaging, identifying who your professional engineer is and engaging those services. The, the discharge limita limitations are set by BPJ, Best Professional Judgment, uh, which is a resource intensive process. I talked about that earlier. Uh, this is a site-specific determination, almost a, a mini ELG process, taking into account what the pollutant loading is for the bottom ash transport water system, uh, sampling analysis uh, over a, a long period of time. So if you have a bottom ash transport water system in place, such as a surge, submerged flight, flight conveyor system, and you haven't already started sampling from day one, um, which I, I know from my past experiences, we told the stations that as soon as they got started that they wanted at a minimum to do sampling once or twice a month. And as soon as the project shut down, those same stations stopped doing the sampling because it wasn't in their budget. And here we are a year or two later and they have very limited data set and now it's time to start sampling again. So. Uh, they can support any sort of BPJ effort. Uh, assess available technology efficiencies, assess cost and incremental costs of wastewater treatment technologies, estimate the pollutant reductions, assess, well, got that typo in there we didn't catch, assess non-water quality environmental impacts, uh, determine best available technology economically achievable, and a tiered approach to type of discharge that could be applied. Uh, so, yeah, you know, this is once again going through the whole process uh, for a specific site that the federal government took quite some time, quite a bit of time and resources to accomplish. The state agency is going to be required to do that for everybody that within their jurisdiction that's applying for it. So if you're the only power plant in your state, coal fire plant may not be an issue, but it also would be indicative of a lack of experience by your regulatory agencies, your state agency at that point. So engage as soon as possible, work with them. Uh, communications is gonna get you the best outcome. Uh, so we have bottom ash exceptions also. So the first one, very similar to the to what we had for FGD wastewater, low capacity utilization rating, that's where that CUR term comes in. That's that two year, maybe 24 months to be determined. Uh, annual generation of less than 10% of your nameplate capacity and requires the best management uh, practices plan to maximize your recycle. Uh, the other exception is if you're gonna retire your unit uh, from, from coal firing or you're gonna cease coal firing by December of 28. So as we go into the exceptions once again, and, and if I'm losing you along the way here, that, that's, that's good because as we're dealing with regulations, you know, not everything necessarily is supposed to make sense. We just have to understand them, reread them several times and to understand all the nuances here. And here, here's an example of where things tend to get a little confusing. So low utilization boilers requires, we have TSS limits here uh, for, for bottom ash transport water where that can be discharged. Um, and the soon, soon as possible date is one year from the Federal Register publication date, once again. Uh, 
requires a notice of plan participation, once again, within a year of, of publication. Uh, certification requires that the BMP plan to maximize recycle within two years of the as soon as possible date. So that's two years after one year after the publication date. And just to translate that into normal English, uh, that's fourth quarter of 23, assuming that it's going to be published. So that's one plus two, that's three years from now, is, is when that certification of your BMP needs to be in place. Uh, you must have operated as a low capacity utilization, util, utilization rate rating prior to December of 23. So uh, if we look back at what the definition is of a low CUR, that's two-year rolling average. So if you think that low capacity is in your future, uh, beginning next December, or excuse me, beginning yeah next December, January of uh, of of 21, I uh, pr probably need to start or excuse me January of 22. Can't do math. I'm an engineer. Sorry. Um, you, you need to make sure you're hitting your numbers, or you may not qualify. Uh, so get into the nuances of the rule. Requires initial certification and annual recertification. It's very similar to what I mentioned uh, with the FGD units uh, using EIA submission data. And then once again, failure to annually recertify requires compliance to the BAT limits within two years of recertification date. Uh, along Along with the with this ex exemption or exception, uh, there is a BMP. Uh, how to maximize recycle? Once again, this is a PE certification and signature that should include statement that the PE is familiar with the regulation and the facility. Uh, calculations of the active wetted bottom ash system volume, including all assumptions, calculations the PE used to determine the volume, a detailed water balance. And I would suggest here that the detailed water balance is not what you submit on your NPDES permit. That is a very high level water balance and would I would not say that is the level of detail that you would need here. This would be a water balance around your bottom ash transport water system. So unfortunately, some of these some of these flows, some of these pipes don't necessarily have flow meters on them right now. Uh, something taken into consideration how to collect that data. A comprehensive preventive maintenance program description and documentation of the maintenance performed daily daily inspection for leaks. And daily inspection for leaks doesn't mean when people are available with reduced staffing, um, doesn't necessarily mean as written when the units are, just when the units are running. Um, so need to take a look at that as staffing plans are being shifted and uh, staff are being shared between uh, facilities. Evaluation of options feasibility, for eliminating or minimizing the discharge of bottom ash transport water, optimizing existing equipment, uh, installing new equipment to achieve maximum recycle, including the dates to be implemented, demonstrating that the system is well operated and maintained, flow monitoring for makeup, sluice rate discharges, and recycle um, actually have flow monitoring in place there. Uh, so that may be a modification that's required to systems that have been installed already where uh, those monitors were not put in, put in place. Uh, annual recertification by the PE shall include not only what the in, uh, initial uh, requirements were on the previous slide here, but also any updates to the BMP plan, weekly flow measurements from the previous year, average gallons per day that were recycled, copies of the annual inspection reports and a summary of preventive maintenance performed on the system. And, and this is one that I emphasized once again, based on my familiarity with how stations operate um, and how many utilities are trying to go to more centralized programs. 
a statement that the plan and flow records are being maintained in an office at the plant. Uh, yeah, having it down at your central engineering offices and your regional uh, SME's office who's supporting this equipment is not at the plant as the rule is currently written. So be aware of that. Um, Coal-fired retirement, very similar once again in, in what the uh, what the definition here is, cease coal fire operations. Uh, 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 it does allow for repowering. Uh, notice of planned participation must be submitted with one year of publication date, including an estimated date of cessation of coal firing and weather retirement, repowering, status of regulatory approval, uh, the most recent IRP or other legally binding document, and schedule with annual status updates. So pretty much you know, it's it needs to be more than, yeah, we're thinking about retiring the station. This is a firm commitment. Uh, the TSS limits that apply here uh, are the are equal to the current BPT, and therefore there's no implementation period it immediately go into effect. So ELGs are implemented through NPDES permits. As such, there is a caveat in the in the rule, which I think has been in there for one degree or another for for many of these rules. Um, that language similar to the below here shall be incorporated into the permit. All permits shall address the circumstances in which a must-run order is received by DOE. Uh, uh, State Public Utility Commission or other reliability order issued by a competent electricity regulator applicable to plants that would otherwise qualify for a low utilization electric generating unit or unit retiring by December of 28. So pretty much that says if you're on track to comply with the low CUR uh, for either bottom ash or or FGD, and we've got a polar vortex running through, coming through, or it's 95 degrees up and down the East Coast and everything that can spin needs to be spinning. Um, uh, if you have a must run order, that's a, that's a get out of jail free card or an exception that won't be held against you. It's very critical that your dispatching group uh, is maintaining this documentation and is aware of these rules. So we, you need to get more than just your, your generating and, and environmental compliance folks involved in this process. Your dispatch group needs to be uh, integral on this also. So in summary here, uh, we, we have FGD and bottom mash transport water updates. For FGD, uh, the technology basis is chemical precipitation, biological treatment, followed by ultrafiltration. And you know, the technology basis is that's not what you need to install. Those are that's just the basis for uh, hitting the hitting the limits or where the limits came from. So if you can achieve those numbers through a different approach, uh, that is certainly available to you. So within FGD, we have the subcategories of high flow facility, which just involves chemical precipitation, low utilization boilers, same. Uh, we can, there's a subcategory for retirement, which that's based on surface impoundments and the voluntary incentive plan or program is based on membrane filtration and brine management. For bottom ash transport water, uh, we've got a high recycle rate system uh, as, as the basis for low utilization, line surface impoundments, and a BMP plan um, are the basis. And if you're going to cease coal firing, surface impoundments, just that TSS limit are the basis for the, for the limits. Uh, you know, other details, read the rule the preamble and the technical development document for site-specific nuances and a more detailed understanding of how the rule's gonna apply to the particular situations that, that 
you know, your coal fire plant has to live with. Um, and the, the other caution that I would throw out there is any legal challenges that are gonna delay the implementation past fourth quarter of this year may have, may have the potential to result in less favorable conditions if we're seeing political climate change. Um, so yeah, if, if you haven't been watching the news on what's going on in the United States here for the, for the last several months, um, yeah, I, yeah, there's a possibility that the environment in DC could swing in one direction or the other very drastically. So a bird in the hand, knowing what we have to deal with today is, is better than having to drag this out and have more uncertainty. So that, that concludes my prepared presentation here. Um, please, if you have any questions, uh, uh, yeah, put them in the chat box here and, and Ryan will, will toss them out. Uh, my contact information is here. Uh, if you can't get a hold of me, Lindy Johnson, also on our team here, is available with her email and phone number. And certainly glad to uh, Glad to get in contact with you uh, and and address any questions, concerns you may have, or or certainly help with with any of those uh, professional engineering certifications that you need for the various uh, exceptions here. So, Ryan, do we have any questions? We sure do. Thank you, Bill. Very informative on that complicated rule, I would say. Uh, first one is uh, asking about boiler water. So would boiler water from a tube leak that falls into the ash pit of a circulating system be considered transport water if it mixes with transport water? That, that's, that's a good question. Um, um, yeah, the, the boiler water itself, if we're, if we're talking about what's in the, in the, in the steam loop there, would not be considered transport water, but as it's dropped into that system, it then, as it commingles, uh, yeah, it, it, I, I would consider it, and this is, you got me talking off the top of my head, I would consider it as, uh, as transport water. You know, as soon as it mixes in, it's, it's make up water to the system and then consider transport. Okay, great. Um, what do you recommend sampling for on the uh, BATW for pollutant loadings, auto mass transport water for pollutant loadings? Um, this this gets site specific once again. Uh, you know, certainly, yeah, I, I look at at corrosion constituents, scaling constituents that would be be in the water, uh, and then yeah, there's there's the arsenic, mercury, selenium are prime candidates. If you have any other constituents in your external outfalls that are currently listed or monitor and report, I would say those are good potential candidates also because you know, all these get, you know, an NPDES permit is site specific. So it takes into consideration your receiving body, whether it's impaired or not, and what the overall loading is into the system. So anything that's currently as an external uh, component and then anything that's that's listed uh, in the rule right now as, as a constituent of concern, I would monitor. Okay, good, thank you. Um, let's see, we got another one here. Uh, okay, uh, first feeder question, let's see. Um, what happens if you have some units that are that qualify for utilization, low utilization or coal uh, fire retirement, but aren't retiring all units? Ah, another good question. Uh, the the low utilization uh, uh, calculation or evaluation applies to a specific unit but the permit applies to the entire site. So if you have a multi-unit site and you have one treatment system, as long as any one of the units 
uh, is, for lack of a better term, high utilization or what used to be normal utilization for the coal industry, um, all the water would then be, unless you had separate treatment systems, all the water would be classified as that high utilization and standard BAT would apply. All right, great. Uh, new one here for selenium reduction. What are the real alternatives to a biological reactor? What are the real alternatives? Well, um, and with with all of these, if you if you don't generate any wastewater, you don't have to treat any wastewater. Um, yeah, that's that's one alternative. So, you know, whether refiring or shutting the units down, those are two alternatives. Um, going to zero discharge, um, whether it's through encapsulation um, or some sort of recycle and reuse in, within the plant, uh, as long as that water doesn't discharge, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, I, I would suggest that you take a hard look at economics of, of what your capital and O&M costs are together, uh, essentially taking a look at total life cycle costs of the system uh, before you make that decision. I, I know one of the facilities that I worked with, they forgot to put in auxiliary boiler or didn't consider that they could only run their brine concentration system to operate in zero discharge uh, when the units were running. And when a hurricane came through and dumped all kinds of storm water into, the, into their system, they were in an outage and they had no way of dealing with all that storm water. Uh, so they got caught in a bind. So you need to make sure whatever technology you put in is thoroughly evaluated holistically on life cycle cost, where this facility is located, what other streams are being incorporated, and if you need to put an auxiliary power unit in there, include that in your life cycle cost. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, do you have any recommendations on the type of equipment used for flow measurement of bottom ash transport water? Uh, uh, that, that that's one, yeah, and and I'm sure the genesis of this is the is the fact that there's there's potential for very erosive service in there. Uh, yeah, you know, some of the ultrasonic, external ultrasonic units, if you're dealing with uh, full channel flow or full pipe flow, uh, certainly applicable there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if some of the um, mag meters that are out there have uh, are hardened that are suitable for the service or not. Yeah, you know, my my first go-to on this catching me off the top of my head would be see if ultrasonics are available there uh, to to avoid any sort of erosion issues. But that's one that, you know, glad to explore that further uh, offline. Okay, thank you, Bill. We have more of a philosophical question here. Uh, with these tight regulations, do you think we will have new coal plants getting developed and built in the U.S.? Uh, and if not, what, what do you see as the future of power generation as more coal plants are getting retired? Nuclear, solar, uh, hydro, like what do you see as the energy mix? Sure, sure. So, yeah, I, I hope you heard my chuckle. Uh, I do have a crystal ball <laughs> on my desk that uh, hasn't been calibrated for for some time. Uh, a friend of mine over at EPRI, Brandon Dellis, he, he usually calibrates this for me every few years. Um, so I, you know, the, the, the new coal fire plants weren't gonna be built in the United States any number of years ago. The ELGs in, in unto themselves aren't preventing new coal fire plants. Um, essentially it's the economics of coal today with natural gas prices where they are, the regulatory requirements that are out there that uh, coal plants are not, building a new coal plant right now is very unlikely to be economically the best option available when uh, natural gas prices putting in a combined cycle uh, facility uh, can can get you much better economics today 
but we had very inexpensive natural gas prices in, in 99, 2000 time period where the industry was putting out uh, uh, combustion turbines in a, in a cookie cutter fashion uh, throughout the country. So obviously energy demands need to be met. People want their air conditioning as we're shutting coal plants down, uh, as we're going to net zero carbon emissions. Uh, at nuclear plants, we've had a number of false starts and the two that are currently still struggling to go forward, uh, uh, they're, it's, it's an ugly process. I, I hope they're successful, but nothing has been conducive out there to encourage folks to, to go forward with, um, with new coal plants or even new nuclear plants at this time. Uh, yeah, the, the last two coal gasification facilities that were built um, were very painful experiences for, for the utilities involved. Um, and, and, and it comes down to the economics. So you know, we, we have solar, we have renewables out there. Uh, I saw something that out west, one of the states determined the economics of wind wasn't, didn't make sense. Not gonna speak to that. Um, but ultimately the United States has an de energy demand that needs to be met. And if we can't meet it at a reasonable uh, cost with the technologies that are available, I think we're going to have to continue staying with fossil until those uh, those technologies can mature. Well, I guess that that's, was, uh, that's a million that dollar a long or, roundabout or, answer. Million dollar question there. Huh? All right. Uh, so at this point, Bill, I'm going to open it up for all the attendees to um, unmute themselves if they would like to either comment or ask a question live. Uh, so we can have some active participation here. And if, if not, that's fine as well, but um, everyone now can unmute themselves if you'd like to ask a question or comment. And while people decide if they want to do that, I just want to say thanks for attending. Uh, everyone, everyone that they did, we really appreciate uh, you joining us today and if you have further questions you have bill and lindy's email and phone there on the screen uh tony put in an item to the chat to our uh, stantech.com page with our calendar for the rest of this year and, and early next year and uh, recordings to all of our webinars uh, if you'd like to explore further subjects with us uh excuse me i uh i had a problem oh we hit someone there and we just lost them if you could try again sir sorry about that all right, here I am. Um, so, uh, Bill, this is uh, Mike Surface. I've, um, I just wanted to tell you, I really thought your presentation was, uh, it took a lot of the nuts and bolts of the, uh, of the rule and really laid it out in a logical fashion. I felt it very enlightening. And I think it's going to be valuable to us to try to work our way through this um, uh, through the process of, um, of the compliance with this. So I just wanted to mention that and say uh, say thank you. I appreciate that, Mike. Yep. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, sir. We'll take more uh, comments like that. Uh, so, uh, hello. Uh, this is Mayor Corbanian from LGN KU. Uh, Bill, uh, Second to what Mike said, thank you very much for the uh, very informative presentation. One uh, bigger question I have, if you could answer, that would be great. If not, we can chat offline. But, um, you know, as, as more power plants are getting shut down or uh, getting these tighter regulations on the water, um, what areas of water use uh, can be, you know, uh, managed better uh, to to mitigate or minimize our uh, water footprint. And I know it's going to be site specific, but generically, or uh, you know, I just want to know your ideas of where we can um, minimize uh, our water use. That way, we don't have to have that much wastewater generated going to Piscan Bio or any other type of treatment. Thank you. 
Sure, appreciate the the comment, Mayar. Um, I, I think the 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 first part of the answer is clearly understanding where the water is being used, where it's coming from, how much is being consumed, and have an accurate water balance uh, for your facility. Uh, you, you heard me quickly mention that you know, the typically water balances that are in NPDES permits are based on annual averages. You know that's uh, that's good for doing some regulatory calculations, but it's it's not really an accurate assessment of what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So clearly identifying your site water balance um, is gonna give you some opportunities. And you know, if, you've, if you've ever been to an outage wash uh, or how anything's cleaned, you know, the standard method of cleaning is a, is a two-inch fire hose. Um, and you know, depending on how many feet of hoses available and the distance from the hydrants, that's typically how many hoses are being used. Uh, a lot of times that same, that same can be done with a three quarter inch industrial garden hose or even a five eighths inch hose as opposed to uh, those huge volumes. So uh, clearly identifying where the water is and with the closure of ash basins, uh, you know, water was essentially free uh, 10 years ago, uh, there weren't any real disposal costs. Now we're, we're having to add flocculants, uh, coagulants, uh, pH adjustments to these flows where prior we were able to commingle in ash basins. So there's a real associated cost for discharge of low volume wastewaters. So providing station leadership with a tool clearly identifying what the cost of water is at the facility can help drive a reduction in, in utilization. But I, I would offer up that most, most operating facilities don't know what it costs them to run a fire hose for 18 hours. Um, and it's, it's a whole lot more than just the cost to pump the water anymore. So, well, we glad to engage with you further offline, Myar. Okay, great. Thanks, Bill. Uh, we've reached a couple minutes past our time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Again, thanks to everybody that attended. Uh, feel free to follow up directly with questions, and we hope to see you on an upcoming webinar. Have a good day, everyone.